Hello, Dave and Tim here for the Single Malt Review, and today's episode takes us back to my favourite distillery of Glendronic. Mm, yes, indeed. It's Glendronic, Dave, but not as we know it. Mm. It is quite, quite the departure. Um, even more of a departure than the Helen, um, eight-year-old bourbon matured, which we reviewed uh, quite strongly recently. Uh, you should check that one out if you're interested. But this is the Glendronic Peated, which shares a few, a few similarities. Um, it is a bourbon matured whiskey, just like the Helen, which has been um, finished, or as they say on the bottle, has undergone a second period of maturation. It's, it's finished, it's finished, it's fine. Um, in Pedro Jimenez and Oloroso casks, so they're um, probably hoping to instill maybe some of that Glendronic character mm. back into it. The heavy lines of Oloroso Pete. Sherry and PX is a bit of a hallmark of Glendronic. Well, Glendronic straight Glendronic, I suppose you could you could coin it, um, is exclusively matured mm. in sherry. It's probably one of the archetypical sherry matured um, distilleries. It's only these latest experiments, the Helen and this so being, um, that they have departed from the whole sherry matured business. Yeah, the peated edition is going to be new for me. I don't remember we've had any of the peated Glendronics before. For any time in the past, it's a very recent addition to Peter, the range. Peter Glendronic, I think, is I think I wouldn't want to call it unheard of, but mm. it will be very, very rare. Yeah. Um, ben Riek is mm. the distillery where these sort of wacky, um, peating Willy Wonka experiments go on because it's less fashionable than Glendronic and has less of a um, has less of a brand, less of an image. Less of a preconception, I think, than Glendronic does. Glendronic is, you'd have to call it maybe slightly typecast as hmm. a bourbon matured brand. You know, Glendronic. The closer business relationship between two firms now, mm. obviously, with a common owner, means they have more room to uh, yeah. overlap. So, uh, Ben, ben Riek is where I expect to see the sort of funny, funny finishes, funny experiments, um, hmm. weird peating things go on. But no, not, not anymore. Um, this Glendronic has undergone undergone the treatment, and I think to no small effect, although there's quite a lot of, um, well, I wouldn't want to call it hate, but there's a bit of criticism out there that mm. it, they've taken it too far, you know, they're, they're breaking the Glendronic mould by, they're messing with it now, people that, um, people that want a Glendronic to stay, stay the archetypical Sherry matured whiskey and are unhappy, unhappy that these no age statement peated things are coming up. But anyway, we're, we're not one of those, so that's fine. So, the whiskey itself, although it doesn't specifically say on the bottle, as far as I know, Glendronic does not chill filter or colour whiskey. Mm. So we will take this, we will take this to heart, this colour, and as for something that has been sherry finished, um, if they have coloured this, they've been very, very restrained because this is not a not a dark whisky at all for something that's even touched sherry. So mm. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt for this one. It'd be very unusual, I'd say, to bottle something that had been chill filtered at 46%. Mm, that certainly would make very little sense. Um, and the chill filtration we will be able to test empirically a bit later on with mm. the power of water. Hint of peat on the nose. Mm. I think more than a hint. Um, there's... What it really doesn't smell like is Glendronic. The, the, mm. the haters are right in that respect. It's very, very different than what you normally expect from Glendronic. Um, bourbon maturation mm. was one thing. That's one step away from the archetype. And then peating on top of that. And it really is a very, very different thing. But the Helen was a very, very different thing. And we loved it. We thought it was mm. a great whiskey. Um, that was one of the best surprises, I think, of 2016. Um, if I'd had a best surprise of 2016, whiskey-wise, that would mm. probably be it. Just how good that eight-year-old whiskey was. It wasn't my favourite, but I'd appreciated the points of difference, at mm. least. And speaking of eight years old, I think that's probably about on the money for this one. Mm. I think there's very little in here that's older than ten. I think there's very little in here that's younger than eight. I think that's kind of the ballpark there. It doesn't smell or taste particularly mm. harsh, nor does it smell or taste particularly old or nuanced. But at any rate, mm, it is significantly peated. Uh, it, it's quite a dry mainland peat, a la Ardmore. Mm. And it's quite a sort of a burned wood peat. It isn't marine like an isla. And so in that respect, it's quite, um, quite true to its area. They haven't just gotten a shipment of isla peat sent up and um, 
done it that way so you don't get that weird confusion like you do with some uh, maybe less considered uh, peated rums that a few mainland distilleries sometimes do and use Isla malt, which I think is usually usually a mistake because they end up tasting weird. Uh, this one, this one doesn't. It's quite dry. There's a lot of sort of smouldering kindling in there. But aside from that, and underneath that, there is the usual bourbon characters that you would expect. Mm. So there's vanilla. There's not an insignificant amount of wood, and little fresh hay, mm. cut grass. There is cut grass, there's a few nuts, there's honey, heather, the normal things you would expect for a, well, very, very lighter style than your typical Glendronic. And there's a lot of char as well, although telling that apart from whether it was charred casks or whether it's coming through from the peat, that's very difficult, so I'm not sure. And that's really all that's on the nose. It's not a complex whiskey, and it's not really, I think, trying to trying to be um, it's trying to be a peated whiskey and that's that's what it is first and foremost mm. and that's what it is first and mm. foremost on my tongue it's a as you say a wood smoke kind of a peat it's not of a mine is strongly of, of smoked fish or smoked meat uh, it's that kind of a smoke mm. Mm. and it's quite quite hard edged but that's sort mm. of okay for a peaty whiskey you don't want too soft a body if there's going to be peat in there, especially at this young age, or the peat will just walk all over all the other flavours. It's pretty prickly at the full strength, but there is quite a good fruitiness evident, even even at its sort of prickly, prickly level here. I think what we will see is a bit of an improvement with the addition of water. We will also discover whether it's been chill filtered or not. I haven't picked any distinct uh, fruit fruitiness at this stage, so hopefully the water will help with that. We'll give it a moment there to reveal itself. In the meantime... Mm. Oh, there comes some fruit. Yeah, that has cut the peat back quite dramatically, and as that curtain is drawn, there is quite a lot of fruit hiding in there. A bit of pear and mango for me. I would agree. It's quite a space id fruit. It's mm. lighter than you would expect from your average Highland whiskey. But it's... And a bit of gooseberry. Mm, it's quite. There's some sour fruits in there, in addition to sweet ones, which probably comes from the peat more than anything else, kind of bleeding through into the fruitier aspects mm. and making things a little more, uh, a little more abnormal for your usual fruity spectrum. Mm. The sort of honey and vanilla is still there, but um, mostly in the background, and there's still quite a good. There's quite a striking woodiness here, mm. which makes me think maybe these were first fill casks or. Quite a lot of them were, but it's quite a woody, quite an oaked whiskey for what it is. On the tongue now, the peat smoke has been heavily cut back by the addition of water. Mm. All those same fruits are there with a little aftertaste of the strawberry. Still quite mm. sharp corners on it, but not um, prickly like it mm. used to be. It's fairly, fairly fresh now. There's room for those underlying fruity flavours to breathe and express themselves a bit. Mm. Now, I'm having a bit of trouble calling that. I think I can see an element. There's an element of cloudiness here. Mm. So I don't think it has been 100% chill filtered. It may have had a light treatment to it. Mm. I'm not sure. But it's not, it's not clouding as much as I would expect it to. It's possible that it just has a naturally light body, given its yeah. short maturation. But... Um, yeah, not not really willing to call that. I think this could be chill filtered to some extent because I would <gasps> see really, really very little cloud on here. So who knows? Really, you'd have to have to ask them. I did mm. not. Mm. So it's a very good, I think, mainland peated whiskey. I'd recommend this as a. As a sort of a fruitier, maybe a little livelier alternative to Ardmore, if you were a fan of such things. I don't think there is a great many Ardmore fans out there, despite um, going infinitely into Teachers, which is quite popular. Um, Ardmore just sort of uh, carries on doing what it does. They've got their own, um, 
they've got their own line of single malts now, so at least it's available for the people that want it. But I don't think there's a great many people out there. So whether this is doing well for Glendronic or not, I'm not absolutely sure. But it does fairly well for me. But I think I understand why a few of the Glendronic purists out there don't really like what it's doing, because for all the things that it is, there's one thing that it really isn't, and that's typical Glendronic. Mm. Even if I were to try and think my way past the peated flavour on the palate and the nose, it's very, very difficult to get what I would consider a typical and it is very typical. Glendronic is one of the whiskies that you can taste blind and have a fairly good show of picking up. And that's even for really, really experienced, even for people way more experienced than us, tasting whiskies blind, being able to pick out a whisky from the plethora of Scottish distilleries, of which there are over a hundred, is very, very different. But there are a few that are not easy, but easier than most. And Glendronic is really one of them. Glendronic, I would probably rate myself, at least, um, that I could pick up a whiskey, smell it, drink it, say, yes, this is Glendronic. It's that distinct. It has that much of its own character. And this has gone a very, very long way from that. I would not be able to make that comparison. Um, was I given this whiskey blind? I would probably say it was an Ardmore, and that's as much of that's as good as my resolution would be on it. So I think it's not a whiskey for really hardcore Glendronic fans. It's a whiskey for people wanting to try something new. Um, because as a as a peated mainland whiskey, as a peated highland whiskey, it is something quite new. And it's not in any way boutique. You can pick this up for quite a lot less than a lot of other Glendronics. I think this is about this is a wee bit less than the 12, about maybe parity with the 12, I don't know, but it's not a lot of money. So there's not a lot of investment there. But yeah, not not for Glendronic fans out there, maybe for peated whiskey fans out there, or maybe just for um, generalist whiskey fans out there, like us wanting to see what the new thing is. And as far as experiments go, I think it's perfectly successful. I think it's a perfectly good whiskey. I just don't know if there's going to be much of a future in it. I'm not absolutely sure who it is for, um, because, as I say, the, the Glendronic fans are going to turn their nose up at it because it's not proper Glendronic. And Peter Whiskey fans, well, they have a sort of a, a bigger smorgasbord available out there from them. I'm not sure why they would turn to Glendronic. So I think whether this broadens out from its experimental capacity and becomes more of a thing, uh, that remains to be seen. But we will watch it with interest at any rate. But scores for this one, um, I really do enjoy this. I don't think it's a particularly profound or transformative whiskey, and I don't think it's a, in terms of creating a Peter Glendronic, I don't think it's 100% successful. It's a good Peter whiskey, but it's gone so far from the Glendronic norm that it's very, very difficult to tie the two together. It's very much its own thing. So this one for me is probably an 81. Mm. What do you think? I'll say in advance, I'm going to go somewhat lower on my scores. This is a very competent moderately peated moderately fruity whiskey it is adequate but when it comes to a distinguished title like Glendronic moderate and adequate and competent are not really words you look for it's it's perfectly drinkable it's okay but it doesn't stand out it lacks uh, the kind of nuance and subtlety and or the grandeur that usually comes with a very distinct distiller's uh, hallmark and overall even leaving aside the fact that it's a Glendronic it rates a 70 from me. I can mm. drink it, I can enjoy it, but it doesn't stand out. It doesn't really distinguish itself in any particular way. I'm a little disappointed. I'd be more, uh, well, be more welcoming to it if it wasn't a Glendronic. It would be um, you know, more what I expect from a a you know less renowned distiller. Mm. So, so says a Glendronic mm. fan, and I think that is going to be its biggest hurdle um, yeah. for such a big and such a distinct distilling name um, it's I think just a little too far out of it's too far off the reservation mm. um, for what people are going to expect for a bottle carrying the Glendronic name I think it maybe almost needs its own um, its own brand um, mm. if they're going to carry it on that would be my um, unsolicited advice that I would give them at any rate uh, for people that are interested or want something a little bit more, I would tend to direct you to 
uh, Ben Reik Distilling Company's mm. other distillery, Ben Reik itself, uh, because though this is a this is a foot you know a toe in the water um, experimenting with peated whiskey, mm. um, Ben Reik have very much gone all the way in, and their uh, excellent Sepindekim, mm. which I have um, reviewed earlier, you can dig up the review. Um, that is one of a great many sort of all ends, you know, jumping in at the deep end experiments that they have done in Ben Reik. And I think both the character of that distillery and the, um, mm, the, the just the behaviour of that distillery. Ben Reik have gone all the way, they've done, they've done heavily peated whiskey, they've mm. done rum finishes, they've, done, they've taken these experimental ideas and really run with them. This one has gone for an experimental idea, a peated Glendronic, but it's been very timid, very conservative in the approach. So the end result has been something quite middle of the road, safe and uh, non-confrontational, uh, really, which is probably not the way to go when you're trying something very bold and very new. Doing it only to a very limited degree has, I think, well, held them back and resulted mm. in something that's just been so. No, I think I think but not safe, amazing. safe, and all the connotations, positive and mm. negative, that brings is probably a good way of describing that one. And as I said, if you want something a little less safe and a little more, um, mm. a little more sort of balls out, all in, here you go. Um, have a look at what uh, mm. Ben Rex got going on because they've got some really, really cracker, cracker peated malts in there. So. At any rate, you can go and look at our review of that one if you want to know more. I won't go on about it here because I suspect we've gone long already. But at any rate, we will go um, long once again very shortly. Um, you carry on with whatever you're doing. Slanjo, keep safe. We'll be right back. <laughs>